Happy Sabbath. Good morning to you. Good evening from wherever you're joining us from. We are so, so glad and happy that you're part of this Sabbath school lesson. Today we are on lesson seven, motivated by hope. Last week we did two, the two witnesses and today we are going to see what it means to be actually motivated by hope and what sort of hope we are talking about. I am joined by my wonderful team members again uh, for this nice study as always. Uh, before we go any further, I'll ask that to just open for us with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that your word can be studied um, today in our own languages, that we can understand it. We are grateful for the promised Holy Spirit who will come and lead us into all truth. We pray that at this hour, he will come and instruct us in your truth, in your righteousness. I pray that those viewers who are listening in today will also open their pages of scripture and that the Holy Spirit will dwell upon their hearts to convince them of truth is our prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are going to do a very wonderful lesson today. And before we go further, before we do the intros and every other thing, I'd like us to say our names and what we'll be, which lesson we'll be doing, starting with you, Jess. Thank you. My name is Jess Swano. I'll be reviewing the promise of his return. Amen, amen. Thanks, Romana. My name is Japheth. I'll be taking us through William Miller and the Bible. Karibu sana. My name is Chris Palmbegera. I'll be doing anticipating the time. Amen. Karibu sana, Chris Palm. My name is Nsongo Rafa Nyamiso. I'll be looking at the 2300 days and the relation to Daniel 8, verse 14. Thank you so much. I'm Ramona Pio, and I'm so, so glad to be doing Lesson 7 with us, Motivated by Hope. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 9. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is such a wonderful verse. This is such an encouraging verse to us. And it is estimated that in the Bible, um, a total of 1,845 Bible verses make reference to the second coming of Christ. And it is throughout the Bible. And that means that in one in every 25 memory verses, it actually mentions the second coming of Christ. Do you actually anticipate the second coming of Christ? Or is it something that you just talk about and you don't mean it? I pray that you mean it. I personally wait for the second coming of Christ with so much eagerness. After the information that we talked about in lesson six the other week, uh, there was so much that happened. Protestantism took root in the new world and now it includes the United States so many people decided that you are going to look for the truth we are going to talk about the truth and among them was a baptist farmer called william miller that you're going to talk about today and from his study of the bible he believed that jesus was coming soon and even in his lifetime and then he began preaching that message it was so long time ago and i know when you are born you're told that jesus is coming soon and even now we are still telling our children that jesus is coming soon the promise may tarry, but it is true and it is sure. In this week's lesson, you're going to examine why the second coming of Christ has filled the hearts of believers with so much joy through the centuries and how we can be ready for that great day. And our study for this week is on the book, the book Great Controversy, which we are still doing uh, on chapters 18 to 21. Before we go to our days or the lesson study, we ask that just please just give us a summary of chapters 18 to 21. Yeah, um, again, reminding that we are studying the great controversy that yes. began in heaven mm -hmm. between God um, and Satan. And yes. we have reviewed the church history all the way from mm -hmm. the beginning, from the Garden of Eden. And we have come up to the period of 1798 when you are seeing that um, um, the Bible, the Bible, the French Revolution has just happened and then the work of God has been resurrected. Mm. And today we are looking at a time when, during that period when we spoke about of 1,260 years, 
when men, a lot of persecution was going on in Europe and many of those Christians who were dedicated to the word of God mm -hmm. fled from Europe to look for a place where they could faithfully worship their God. Yeah. And this is the, th these are the people and characters we start looking at now from this place on henceforth. So mm -hmm. what happened to them? So those who left Europe, they fled to the new world, as you have called it, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And from chapter uh, um, 18 to 21, we'll be looking at what type of studies came about then. Mm -hmm. What Did God add more light to the church at yes. that point? Mm -hmm. And what, wa what was that light that God added? What was the reaction of the people during that time? Mm -hmm. Did the message of the gospel spread out? Did the great controversy continue in earnest? And how did it manifest itself? We'll be studying now, at least from this period, we are looking generally from 1798, and we'll be going all the way looking at um, early 1850s um, to look at the reaction of the church, even when they went forth and uh, declared this gospel that Christ is coming back again. How did the people um, uh, um, react? And we will see that many of them rejected that warning that Christ was going to come back again. And many of them did not look forward to the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. That is what those uh, chapters 18 to 21 cover. And essentially for the Seventh-day Adventist church, it is the proclamation of the first angel message and yes. the second angel message. Mm -hmm. This is where we place it in time um, in the great controversy. Yeah, and when we're talking about the first and the second angel's message, we find that in the book of Revelation chapter 14, which we did some time back. So please, uh, again, our book remains the great controversy, which just keeps reminding us. And again, this is the one starting us off with our study today. The promise of his return. Please take us through. I'm so excited about this Sunday part, I, especially how it is coined. It is the promise. It is a, it, it is a promise that Christ gave exactly. us. And someone would imagine after we have looked at all this history, the question would be like, was it worth it? Like, why do I have to suffer this way? Why did, the, why did people make such a great sacrifice mm -hmm. just for the sake of this truth? It is what kept burning in their hearts. What, what kept them going? It was the blessed hope of the promise that Christ Amen. gave them. Amen. In the book of John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, Christ speaking to his disciples, he himself gives them the promise and tells them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Mm -hmm. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that ye may be also. Mm -hmm. This is what kept the disciples going. That the Christ told them that he would come again. And this is what kept many of the reformers that you have spoken about, who were persecuted, who were chased, who were put in dungeons. What kept them going was the, was the burning hope that Christ will come again and, mm -hmm. and pick them up. Actually, in the book of um, Luke chapter 24, verse 52 and 53, when we see the disciples looking at the ascension of Christ, Two angels appear and tell them, well, why are you looking so sad and why are you looking up? Mm -hmm. This same man who has ascended up will come again in the, in the same, same manner. Mm -hmm. In verse 52 and 53, we are told that they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Mm -hmm. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Mm -hmm. Were they happy that Christ has left them? No. Were they happy that now Christ will not no longer be with them? No. They were happy because of the promise he gave them that he will actually return and come back again. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Martin Luther, whom we have spoken up about in yes. great length, who says that when he looked as, he looks at the times, when he looks at the wickedness in the world, he says, I estimate that Christ will not, 300 years will not go by before the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what they looked forward to. Richard Baxter writes and says that this, the, the, the second coming of Christ to me is a sweet memory. It's a sweet, joyous thing when I hear about it, when I talk about it. Paul continuously encouraged the, the, the Thessalonians when they had lost their loved ones. And he told them that, you know, do not weep as those who do not have hope. We have the hope of the resurrection because Christ will come back again. And we are going, those who are dead will arise. And then those who are alive will meet up with him in the heavens. That Christ's coming is what buoys us up, is what gives us hope, is what keeps the fire burning. That all that we believe in is not in vain. 
we will not just perish and 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 we have lost everything we will die but we have the hope of the resurrection why yeah. because christ resurrected and he will come again and pick us as his own it is such a tragedy that today many christians do not look forward to the second coming of christ yet it is what has kept the fire burning for all those people who have gone ahead of us amen I'm just have I'm just wondering, or rather, have a question for you, Zafir. Just, just has told us that the second coming is what kept the hearts banging. Yeah, they're just waiting for that. The, the the Christians they were waiting for the second coming of Christ, and that is why they they went out to preach the gospel. How is this second coming important in this great controversy? Because I feel like the great controversy keeps intensifying every day. How is it important? Well, the second coming represents the end of a lot of things. Yeah. It represents the end of suffering. Amen. It represents a finality, at least for the human experience, mm. that we can say from that point on, it is glory. Amen. Right now, we, we have the hope of glory. Mm. Yes. But Paul tells us that now we are seeing through a glass darkly. Mm -hmm. It's like we can sort of see and we know how we have faith that Christ is coming mm -hmm. to put an end to suffering and to bring in ever, just like wonderful bliss. But at that particular point, the second coming will represent the realization of that hope. Amen. And so it will be such a wonderful Amen. experience and a hope and an expectation for so many of us who, 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 who don't just want suffering to end, but even our loved ones, our friends, mm -hmm. that communion with God himself, meeting God face to face. Right now, it is a wonderful thing to pray to God, but one, how much more wonderful face to face. Mm -hmm. So it represents a change from, 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 from seeing through a glass darkly to seeing face to face. Amen. I look forward to get together and especially with family. And there's a family I lost, my cousin. That I usually pray and tell myself, you know what, God, that day when we meet on the skies, as in the, the book of the Salonians, as Paul tells the Thessalonians, that there'll be a great get together. Amen. I don't know if that is also your anticipation. And that said, we move to the Monday part where we are talking about anticipating the time. And we'll be led by our brother, Chris Paul. Karibu sana. Thank you so much. Mm. My sister Jess has just. Uh, explained to us why the promise of Christ's return was that which propelled the agency, the urgency with which the disciples went forth to declare uh, the message that Christ had bidden them declare mm. in when he left them after his return to earth. And now when after that time, after the passing of the time, the disciples in their time, in the context in which they lived, the, the very urgent need that they found, they had found themselves in was they were under the Roman yoke. They were, yeah. they were under bondage. Yeah. And so to be released from bondage was the hope to which the Christ, mm. the coming of Christ presented. Mm. And thus, they, when they hear this message that the Messiah is coming, mm. to them what happened is that they, they, they immediately understood that this Messiah mm. was to come to deliver us from, from, from the, Roman the Roman bondage. Yeah. And you see, what happens is that sometimes, and later on, as the times began in the Middle Ages, with the development of truth, there came other uh, preaching of the coming of Christ, which presented that there will be a time of a thousand years of rest, a, th a thousand years of of um, peace, when that were to pre to precede the coming of Christ, the final second coming of Christ, and this also led to the to the uh, in the anticipation of his coming, they led to making the people lethargic, making them not mm. have the urgency mm. that Christ had presented. Remember. From the Old Testament, from the days of Enoch, the coming of Christ has always been presented with a spirit of urgency. Throughout scripture, that the anticipation of the coming of Christ has not been presented as, a, as an event far too distant in the future, mm. but as, a, as an event that is even at, at the, the door. door. Yes. Mm. And because of that, when there is anything that interferes with that spirit of urgency and understanding of the coming of Christ, mm. it presents, it makes us 
lethargic and low in our faith mm. and even in the labor for the souls mm. for whom God has, uh, mm. has given us to do. And, and you see, now these transitions to when now when, um, I like, I like maybe before I, I say in the next thought, there is uh, an idea in Matthew 24 that Christ presents. says that there was this time when the, uh, in Matthew 24 verse um, 47, uh, sorry, verse uh, 46, 24 verse 46 says that blessed is the servant whom when the Lord cometh when he shall find so doing. That is, he shall be a wise and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Verse 48 says that, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Mm -hmm. If we say in our heart, and by the, the anticipation of the coming of Christ, by what Christ means here, by saying that my Lord delayeth his coming, it might not be by what we say. It might not be by us completely uh, seeing that the Christ's coming has is not going to happen mm -hmm. by rejecting that doctrine. It might be by how we live mm -hmm. our lives. Mm -hmm. There is a way in which we can live our lives yeah. that represents that indeed we are not anticipating that coming. Yeah. How have we invested our resources? Mm -hmm. How have we uh, uh, lived our lives mm -hmm. in terms of our devotional lives? How are we laboring for souls? Are we working with a spirit of urgency right. with which this, the Bible has presented? Mm -hmm. And I love what the lesson writer puts there that an early Adventist leader, Luther Warren, used to tell young people that the only way to be ready for the coming of Christ is to get ready and stay, and stay ready. ready. Mm -hmm. To get ready and continue in that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do not only get ready, but you have to keep ready. You have, in essence, what the coach always says to the players. Keep your eyes on the, on the ball. Mm -hmm. You have continually, because once we lose that focus, we'll be as that servant who says, my Lord death is coming. Mm -hmm. And that indeed will make us lethargic and lead us. So, the, 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 and every day we are making ourselves ready or delaying the second coming of Christ. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that unless the gospel is preached to all the four corners of the world, his coming is not any near. And perhaps you've been hearing this thing, the Lord is coming, Jesus is coming soon, since you are young. And some even say that, you know, my grandmother told me, now my mother has told me, now I'm telling my children, and perhaps maybe my children will tell my, their children too. Like I said, that promise might tarry, and you might be the one who's delaying the coming of Christ by how you are living. You are not even laboring for souls. The urgency remains as it was from the first, from yeah. when Christ ascended to heaven until now. The urgency remains. The question is, are you part of those that are in the urgent living? And we move to my favorite part, the history part. William Miller and the Bible. Please, Zafet, take us through it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think over the course of um, these many, many lessons, we've actually been encountering many of God's instruments, exactly. many of God's axes, mm -hmm. many of God's swords, many of God's hammers mm -hmm. that he has been using to deliver particular messages for his people. Mm -hmm. For instance, we know of Martin Luther, yeah. who was a monk, mm -hmm. who knew nothing even of the scriptures, mm -hmm. who learned within the scriptures the special message of justification mm -hmm. by faith. Mm -hmm. There's actually another instrument of the Lord, a sword that at that time did not want to be used, mm -hmm. that the Lord eventually used to declare the message of Jesus Christ's second coming. Mm -hmm. And this individual's name was William Miller. William Miller was actually a deist. He's somebody who, let's say, he does not, he believes that God exists at that time, but did not believe that God was active and present in the world and, 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 and let's say answering prayers and mm -hmm. things, almost like Let's say somebody who is a landlord who has built a beautiful uh, a, a apartment block then walks away. Mm. So you can't go and ask him for things, mm. right? You can't ask him, oh, come and fix the, you know, the plumbing. But at the mm. same time, you don't have to pay rent. Mm. So that was the idea that the day is had. And William Miller was one such person. Until over the course of his life, he had an encounter with the Lord, an experience he was drafted in a particular war. Mm -hmm. And in that particular war, he was engaged in a time when his life was in danger. And that his, the, 
the driving theory of his life that God does not intervene was actually shattered when God intervened and saved his life. And from that point on, as he began to re reflect upon what happened in that experience during that war, I think it was the war of 1812 between America and the UK. At that particular time, that's when he realized, oh my goodness, that God can actually intervene. And this brought him to a closer encounter with God, to a closer encounter with the word of God. And at that time, he felt, no, I cannot believe what other people are saying. I will not receive pre-chewed word. I will study the word for myself. Mm. And so William Miller himself, mm. a concordance alone, I, I can't remember the name of the concordance, a concordance and the Bible. He began step by step, line upon line, studying the Bible mm. until he came to an understanding of particular truths, specifically the truths of the second coming. Amen. And there, there's a particular text in the, in the scripture that can really inform us um, uh, 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 how how clearly the Bible was a guide to him. In the book of Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 and verse 10, we are told, uh, God speaking, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And verse 10 is instructive. He tells us precept must be upon precept. Precept, mm -hmm. precept upon precept, line upon, upon line, line, line upon line, mm -hmm. here a little and, and there a little. That is from the King James Version. Mm -hmm. So that is actually what happened. William Miller took one line upon another line. Mm. He understood that the Holy Scriptures were inspired by one Holy Spirit. In the book uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21, we read, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you, you take it as unto a light that shines in darkness. Prophecy, a light that shines in darkness, unto the day, uh, until the day dawn and the day star, arise in your hearts knowing that no prophecy is of any uh, is of any private interpretation mm. but what but for the prophecy came not of all times by the will of man but the holy men were spoke as they were moved by the holy ghost mm. so you can see this is what instructed the life of william miller that he accepted that the scripture is one mm. you take line upon line mm. that the scripture was inspired by god mm. That means what you find in Ezekiel, what you find in Isaiah, what you find in Revelation, in Genesis, you can put together in a way that makes sense from the scriptures itself. And he was able to build a, an understanding of the Bible. And you and I can apply the same rule. We do not have to take my word, somebody, some other person's word, some pastor, some elder, some priest. No, you just take the scripture, pray like William Miller did and appreciate that God himself will give you an understanding of the scriptures. In the book of Proverbs chapter 8, verse 8 to 9, we are told that concerning the word of God, they are all plain to him that understandeth. And that understanding again comes from the Holy Spirit. Again, from John chapter 16, verse 13, this is a promise from Jesus Christ who loves us. He tells us, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all truth. Why? Mm. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he, he speak, and he shall show you the things concerning, uh, uh, he shall show you things to come. So here William Miller was instructed by the scriptures mm. and on one special thing. He was instructed that Bible prophecy is not something that you and I should be scared of. Yeah. It is not something that you and I should be fearful of. Mm. In fact, almost all the texts that we have gone through, yes, they speak of the Bible, but specifically they speak of Bible right. prophecy. And let's be honest, there is a kind of almost like a stigma against the prophecy because we understand we have seen so many funny, sometimes foolish, sometimes nonsensical things from how other people take the Bible and especially Bible prophecy. They say, oh, I have seen the scripture. God has shown me this will happen. That is true. And, and as a result of all these false prophecies, as a result of seeing that Jesus says, beware of false prophets, we start saying all of prophecy is not for us. Let's just stick with the cross, which is a wonderful doctrine. But then much more than just that alone, we must appreciate the more sure word of prophecy. Yeah. This is precisely what William Miller did. And in his study of Bible prophecy, William Miller came to a special understanding of special truth that we'll, we'll understand shortly. In the book of Daniel chapter, um, chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 45, we actually understand what is the key theme of Bible prophecy. We are told Daniel 2, 2, 2 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of a mountain without a hand 
and, and it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, the interpretation thereof is sure. In a prophecy that God gave to Daniel, we actually find a very special interpretation. And this special interpretation is what? That, that God's kingdom ultimately is the one that shall endure unto the end. God's kingdom ultimately is the one that shall be established. And this is the key of, of Bible prophecy. In the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 to 3, on that prophecy, that book of prophecy that so many people unfortunately are very fearful of. Revelation, the very first section, you know, we know the book of Revelation as the revelation of who? Of, of Jesus yes, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but people call it the revelation of John, you know. <laughs> but the Bible tells us Revelation chapter 1. This is the book giving its own title. Revelation chapter 1, verse um, 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. Um, uh, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Amen. God's message and God's Amen. movement are prophetic and there is nothing wrong and there are so many wonderful right things mm. with embracing Bible prophecy even as William Miller did, even as you and I should. Amen. Amen. We should actually just embrace Bible prophecy. Before I continue, I'd like to ask this. Why is it important that we understand the prophetic symbols in the Bible to a Christian? Why should you have, why is it important that you, you understand the symbols and not just any other symbols, but the correct interpretation? Why is it important? Um, I think we mentioned this last week. Um, uh, Actually, let me just go back. In, in the book of, um, in the book of um, Acts, we are told that in the last days, God will give people, his people dreams and visions, and he'll speak through dreams and visions. Other, uh, in another place in the Bible, we are told that he will speak to his people through similitudes and symbols. So it is true that the, the word of God is not always plain. And because the Bible, we are told, um, it is not given for any private interpretation. We are allowed to, we, we allow the Bible to interpret mm. itself. It means that we need to go back line upon line, precept upon precepts to understand what the symbols that God has given us to be able to understand. Even when Christ was here on earth, Christ did not always speak with plain language. He used parables often to be able to communicate a message and, uh, and to be able to, to, to give uh, an understanding to the people through the things that they saw around them to allow them to understand. So it's very clear. If we are to understand the whole Bible, mm. we cannot shy away from understanding what are some of the symbols that the Bible uses mm. to be able to allow us to unlock mm. things that are hidden from plain sight that cannot be discerned with human eyes, mm. but God has revealed to us if we actually studied through to understand, to see the symbols that God himself uses. Amen. Amen. And I know you are wondering, is it with Tunasema, precept upon precept, line upon line, where are they? Who will, where is this? Uh, it is in the Bible. We read that from the book of Isaiah chapter 28. And it says from verse 9, whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just wind from milk, those just drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there yeah. a little. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Depending on which version you're reading from, the word is still the same. Beloved, maybe you've been postponing reading the book of Daniel, Revelation, because that is where the bulk of the prophecy is. And you've been telling yourself, prophecy, it looks like just, it's, it's, she's the only one who can understand this. So you've left just to read for you prophecy and come here and interpret it for you. The lesson writer says that William Miller took his Bible, a pen, and a notebook. He began reading at Genesis and read no faster than he could understand the passage at hand. By comparing scripture with scripture, he allowed the Bible to do what? Explain itself. Amen. There is no rocket science in reading the Bible. That is it. That is what you need to do. Uh, we move to the Wednesday part. 
the 2300 days of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. I don't know if we, you need a whiteboard and a marker. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to get a whiteboard and a marker, but and, uh, mm -hmm. I know the charts and all these things are there. Resources are there uh, online. And uh, once again, we encourage you to read uh, more um, more in-depthly and, uh, and perhaps even with better English than, uh, than is in this panel uh, <laughs> from the book, The Great Controversy. So um, Wednesday speaks to us about just building up from what uh, my, my sisters and brother brothers have shared, it speaks to us about Miller's way of, uh, of Bible study. He was uh, leading, uh, re reading the Bible from uh, using, a, using the Bible itself and a concordance. I think it's called Cruden's Concordance, uh, published around 1723 by a Scottish man called Alexander Cruden. So um, using this concordance, uh, Miller, having a desire to know God, Sort, um, you know, for, and I think the example of Miller is important. If I will digress for a moment, it tells us that once we have met with God and have a desire for God, we shouldn't look to men and women for instruction, but rather go to God's word. Amen. We see Miller applying himself to the text, applying himself to scripture, and using a, a, a concordance tries to understand what exactly is God saying. Mm. And then beyond that, also, as Christians, it is upon us to. Um, to take ourselves to task, to study the Bible in, in its entirety. Sometimes maybe you can say there are certain verses in Leviticus and in, and, and in Revelation, certain texts that seem, seem, seem blurry, they seem very old, very ritualistic. But we come to understand that a lot of the Old Testament is, 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 is rich with sanctuary, the theme of the sanctuary, which is also tied to the great controversy. Mm -hmm. And so Miller did not shy away even from uncomfortable verses in, in Daniel and in Revelation. And as a result of that, they came up uh, a wonderful revival. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and these are the things that we are, we are studying today. So as part of uh, Miller's system of studying, he noticed a pattern in the way God works. Mm -hmm. he, noted, he noted, for example, that God also worked with time periods. Yeah. You see, when God appears to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he tells him, and, and they're signing that, contra, uh, that, that covenant, uh, making him a people, and he tells him about his people, he tells him that his people will be out, will be prisoners for 400 years. He comes again uh, and speaks um, in, in different, uh, differently in different areas. In Daniel 9 and verse 24, he speaks about 70 weeks allotted somewhere. And he speaks about in, um, in, um, in Jeremiah 25 and verse 11, he spoke, speaking about the Israeli, Israel captivity in Babylon and says it will be for 70 years. And we see uh, God always, almost always working with a timeline. And speaking uh, now, applying this to the gospel, we read it from the book of Mark 1 and verse 15. Reading from the King James Version, it says, And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is what? At hand. Repent ye, and believe ye the gospel. The time is fulfilled. There's an aspect of time coming to an end. Divine reckoning of, 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 of the time. Galatians 4 and verse 4, Paul writing to Galatians and to us, tells us, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. That the divine clock, as, as soon as the divine clock hit the appropriate time, lo and behold, a babe was born in Bethlehem in a manger, mm -hmm. in the fullness of time. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says, And when we were yet without strength, in due time, once again that word called time, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And so we see God has a pattern of working with time. 400 years for the Israeli captivity in Egypt, 70 for them in Babylon. And then he speaks about another 70 weeks allotted in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Mm -hmm. And so Miller understands that God is a God of order and that God works with timelines. Yeah. And so as he continues with his studies, he gets somewhere to the book of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, Miller having been... Um, as, as was the people in that particular time animated and being attracted to this theme of Christ's second coming. But I would also maybe digress for a moment also when you talk about the second coming. I believe the power of the second coming of Christ is in his, his resurrection. I think that's a, that's, that's a key thing that we perhaps may forget as we romanticize and, 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 and really paint the second coming and all these things. But the resurrection in and of itself was pivotal because he who died came back to life again. Amen. 
that and that was such a powerful thing and 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 it is on the resurrection that then we for a fact can know that he is going to come again mm-hmm. because he lives as one author uh one hymn writer says and so as 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 the christians of this day were cognizant that christ had risen and that he had given them this wonderful promise of his second coming and they were animated at with its thoughts along comes this text in daniel 8 and verse 14 reading from the king james version Mila is met with it and he, he reads it and it says and now daniel is in vision in this part text it's daniel and an angel daniel is hearing an angel speaking to another angel and they're asking about events that are going to happen in the in the end times and one angel speaks to another and he says and to 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed we see once again an aspect of the sanctuary there something i, I think we ought also to study uh, in great depth and so the christians of that particular day understood the cleansing of the sanctuary to be synonymous and to be the same thing as the second coming of Christ, as the the return of Christ um, here on earth. And so, but now he's told that there's a timeline, that there shall be 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Of course, we have the day-year principle from uh, uh, Numbers 14 and verse 34, as well as from Ezekiel, and we we know that there is a day-year principle, and Mila also establishes the day-year principle and he sees, and eventually he has, he finds himself with 2,300 years. And he's asking himself, when do these things start? When do these things start? Because God has got a system. We know, for example, for the Egyptian captivity, it is when they went into Egypt. For Babylonian captivity, it is when we see Daniel, who, from, who, from whom all these things are happening. You see the setting is uh, them in captivity. And so um, he sees the starting point is, when uh, until 2300 days and so later on as the, as the text continues um, as daniel he, he himself is, is confused about these things as he's considering it um in daniel uh, chapter 8 in verse 27 if you're to go with me the bible records and says and i daniel fainted daniel 8 and verse 27 and was sick certain days afterward i rose up and did the king's business and was astonished for the vision but none understood it so we find daniel has been given this vision of the 2300 days, but he can't really wrap his brain about, uh, around it. And perhaps you, the viewer, may be having difficulty with this matter. Be encouraged that even Daniel yeah. found these matters not very easy. Mm-hmm. But as we see, eventually God breaks it down yeah. for Daniel. Eventually God breaks it down for Daniel. We find now eventually uh, the angel comes once again in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 22. And he says uh, the following. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 22, he says, And he informed me, this angel, talking to Daniel, and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and what? Understanding. Understanding. Mm -hmm. You see, Daniel is astonished by this message. Daniel is is, is dumbfounded. The Bible records that Daniel, this this angel was sent in response to prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, when we are, when we are, we arrested perhaps our attention and our minds and our peace is taken away from us because we do not understand certain aspects of the Bible, then it is a call to prayer. It is a call to ask God's spirit to indeed create in us a clean heart and renew our right spirit to open to us and show us wonderful things, wondrous things from his word. Daniel 9 verse 23, reading from the King James Version tells and says the following, at the beginning of the supplications, the commandment came. So Daniel was praying and I am come forth to show thee that thou art greatly beloved and therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So in Daniel chapter 9, we see an angel has come and is going to break down the 2300 day prophecy to Daniel and to us by extension. He begins in verse 25 and he says, Know therefore and understand, Daniel 9 and verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to do what? And to build Jerusalem and to the Messiah, the prince, shall be how many weeks? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be rebuilt again and the wall even in troublous times. And then he continues and says, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people, uh, and the people of the prince that shall come, uh, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end therefore shall be with a flood. But unto, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And it continues and says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Mm-hmm. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. 
and the overspreading of the abominations, and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, cons consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. desolate. And so we see he is given uh, a vision. An angel is sent to him, and he is made to understand. He is told in verse 24 that 70 weeks are determined unto your people and to the holy city. 70 weeks are determined. And the Bible use, uses the word determined there, literally is translated as cut off. We see, you can only cut off something if it is part of a whole. You can only say this, these 70 weeks are cut off. These 70 weeks are determined from, uh, from something because there is a hole. And the hole from which these 70 weeks are cut off is the 2300 uh, days that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that Daniel has been told about in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And so we see these 70 weeks using our day year principle is 70 times 7 is 490 days. Applying a day for a year using the day year principle, a vital principle that the, the, the reader as well as the listener or the viewer needs to understand that is based on, on, on scripture that has been proven, uh, time, uh, time proven. And we, fi we find 490 years. And so we are told 490 years are cut off, but they are cut off from what? From the vision of the 2300 days or the 2300 years. Okay? And so, therefore, we see now we have gotten the starting point of this uh, 2300 days from the 70 time, 70 weeks period. And since the starting point of the 70 weeks was from the going forth of the command to restore and to do what? To rebuild Jesus. Jerusalem. Miller was able to find his starting point in Daniel 9 and verse 25. Miller then knew that if he were, that he had that date, he could know the beginning of the 70 weeks and also subsequently the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. And so we see, um, basically Miller now gets his starting point and he is able now to start calculating what he believes in his mind and he is convicted, what he preached to others who are called the Millerites as the time of Christ's second coming. Mm, amen. And I think this is the 1844, but I know we look at it as we go by with our standing. The 2300 days. I know it's not an easy concept, but as Daniel did, he went into prayer and supplication. It's actually in Daniel chapter 9. It says... Daniel chapter 9, a very powerful prayer in the Bible. But before we get to chapter 9, verse 27 of Daniel 8, it says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards, I rose and went about king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Daniel got discouraged at some point because he wasn't understanding. And just like uh, on, our brother on Songo is telling us, perhaps you are not understanding and you're getting discouraged and you're saying, mm -mm, this, this is not meant for me. This is too hard for me. But do you know what happens? The Lord, Daniel prays and the Lord himself sends his favorite angel, Gabriel, to come and do what? Make him understand for it in verse 22 of Daniel 9, it says, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to do what? To understand. And verse 23 is the most interesting part. It says, At the beginning of your supplication and the command, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, that therefore consider the matter and understand what? The vision. vision. And verse 24, all the way to 27, the vision is made plain and clear to him. So if you're struggling, you're not the first one, you'll not be the last one. Please do what Daniel did. It is so hard nowadays. At least Kitambo, Kinamila, Kinam, Luther used to fast and pray if they didn't understand scripture. How many times do you fast and pray if you don't understand scripture? Or when do you fast and pray? When you need a job, when someone is sick, when you need this and that, even when you want to understand the word of God, you can also do what? fast and pray Amen. and we move to the almost coming to the end of the study we move to the longest prophetic timeline thursday oh before we okay i'll say it later <laughs> the thursday part the longest prophetic timeline we'll start with zafet and this then we move to artist and brother on Songa.
Uh, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we have just had a discussion about the 2,300 year prophecy. And then we saw that the key to understand that one, because it, it could not be understood because Daniel was confused even. Uh, uh, it was actually found in uh, Daniel chapter 9. And, and the key was found, in fact, in Daniel chapter 10 verse 1, Daniel himself says, now I understand. That means the key must be there in Daniel chapter 9. Mm -hmm. So Daniel 9, we are told the beginning to understand the prophecy is the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now that command, historically, uh, uh, like we have to go to history to find when that command was given. There are three commands given to rebuild uh, something. Um, uh, 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 the first command given was to rebuild the temple. And that was given by Cyrus in the very end of the book, Second Chronicles. There's a command by Cyrus to go and rebuild the temple, just the temple. This does not fulfill the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Mm -hmm. And then the second command is given. It's like a reiteration of the command that Cyrus gave. But then the third decree was the decree to command to go and restore and rebuild not just Jerusalem, not just the temple, but even the walls and basically even reestablish the entire system of running of that temple. It is found in the book of Ezra chapter 7 from verse 7 until verse 13. I think I'll just jump to verse 11, which gives us the date. But from 7 to 13, in fact, onwards, it's actually a decree, a whole letter from King Ataxaxis to basically uh, restart the entirety of the economy of Jerusalem to rebuild. Even the money is given to do that work. And the time is in verse 11, the copy of the letter. Um, sorry, verse 9. Uh, upon the first day of the first month began to go from Babylon and on the first day of the fifth month came into Jerusalem. Um, uh, uh, sorry, actually it's in verse 8. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. So that means in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And you can actually go and ask yourself, historically, when was the first year of the king of Artaxerxes? Count 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that seventh year was actually 457 BC. Precisely mm -hmm. And, and from there, we can actually begin to do our calculations that the rest of the panelists will do. And, and, and it's actually a sure nail that helps us to appreciate when the prophecy of the 490 years ends mm -hmm. and when the prophecy of the 2300 day ends. Mm -hmm. So the, the beginning of the prophecy is in Ezra chapter 7, verse 8 specifically, but actually it's Ezra 7, verse 7 to verse 13. Yeah, thank you, James. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Japheth has um, given us when we start, 457 BC. Mm -hmm. And so when we start in 457 BC, we are told in verse 25 of Daniel that know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and to, and to the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. So the restoration of Jerusalem to become a political system, the economic and the financial um, restoration and even their spiritual um, and worship system to be restored, allotted seven weeks. Then from that time, 62 weeks are determined. From that point, 62 weeks up to the coming of the Messiah. Mm. If I take those 62 weeks and seven weeks, those are 69 weeks, making up a day for a year. Mm. For, those are... 483 days therefore 483 years mm -hmm. from 457 uh, bc adding 483 years the command was given in autumn of 457 bc so mm -hmm. we'll count 483 years up to autumn of 27 a.d for the messiah to come and that is when what happens at that point we see in the book of mark chapter one what um our brother alluded to Christ coming saying the time has been fulfilled and we see Christ being baptized and this is the first time that Christ is called the Messiah. And after that time we are told to make it a complete 70 weeks, to make it 490 years. We have seen 483, we are given an extra, an, an, an extra period where we are told that there will be a, 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 again this week that the Messiah will preach for three and a half years. And then there will be another time allotted three and a half years for the work to continue on being um, being a witness by the disciples. And then we will see the destruction of Jerusalem coming, giving us the complete period of 490 years from the, the time the, the commandment went forth in 457 B.C., adding 490 years to bring us to 34 AD when Christ is up. after Christ has finished his ministry then the, we see Christ's death and we see now the I mean the, the ministry now going forth being proclaimed
for another three and a half years by the disciples up to the close of the probation of the Jews. I, I'm sorry, I'm really summarizing because of time. I know, but yes. I know. <laughs> and say one of the things that, the, one of the challenges that we've been having is time. The lesson is so intense, so many concepts, but time is not on our side. Um, we move to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We'll be led by Chris Pyle and Onsongo, whoever wants to start. <laughs> Uh, so Daniel 9.27 says that he shall confirm the covenant uh, with many for one week. That is the last week of the 70 weeks. Mm. And in that week, Christ, the first half of the week, the three and a half years, in the midst of the week, it says that he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. By cru being crucified, Christ brought to an end the sacrificial system mm. that had lasted since the time of the Old Testament. And then after that, uh, after three years, and, and after that, for the overspreading of the oblation, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation that shall be determined and shall be poured upon the desolate. And at the end of the 70 weeks, what happens is that the gospel, at a, as our sister said uh, correctly, in AD 34, that time comes to an end when the Jews reject the message that had been especially committed to them. by And this was signified in the book of Acts chapter 6 from verse 8 to verse uh, uh, 7, chapter 7 verse 60, which is actually when Stephen is stoned by the, by the Jews and, and at that point where Stephen is being stoned, Paul is there watching the death of Stephen and immediately after, a short time after, the message now God uses the same person who was there at the stoning of Stephen to take the message that was especially for the Jews to the entire Gentile world. So I'll leave my brother Songo to uh, conclude for us. Indeed, uh, it's an interesting um, topic to talk about uh, the longest prophetic timeline uh, in which uh, it truly is long because even time is not enough for us to talk about it. Um, and so um, just to tell us that um, eventually Miller having gotten his starting point as 457 BC, by the time the 70 weeks are ending it is around 34 AD and it is a time in which Stephen is stoned and the, and, the, and, the, and the children of Israel and Israel as a nation, Israel as, as, as a religious nation actively rejects Christ. Indeed, sometimes uh, even in, uh, in history right now there is what they call the rabbinical curse. And, uh, and, uh, and it is a curse that is put on anybody who looks to interpret uh, this portion of Daniel chapter 9. Because they say it is cursed. Because whoever reads it then for a fact will know that Judaism is not waiting for a Messiah to come. But rather the Messiah came and he is our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And they crucified him on that tree. And so this longest time prophecy eventually ends the 2300 days and uh, the 70 weeks end in 34 AD. And you are uh, left with 810, uh, 18, 1810, 1810 uh, uh, years, which you, when you add, eventually you get to the year 1844. And therefore, we see that Miller and the Millerites, those who followed him from around the, the, the 1842 all the way to 1844, they started preaching the second coming of Christ. Their understanding was that the sanctuary that Christ was going to, to, to cleanse was this earth. And he was going to come the second time and cleanse it with fire. And, uh, and therefore then we see wha what was eventually built up to what was known as the great disappointment. Amen. Hey, beloved, we wish to continue and make this truth known to us and even make you understand. But time is not ours on our side. And therefore we send you back to the great controversy to go and read for yourself. If you haven't understood anything, because I know this lesson was intense and it was heavy. If it was heavy for Daniel, pro, uh, most pro, uh, evidently it will also be um, hard for you. So please feel free to ask the questions. Uh, the points where you haven't understood, the panel is here to make the, the, the concepts known to you. So please feel free to ask. What I wanted to say is in regards to timing, because it's one of the things that we've been talking about in this lesson, the time, 2,300 2, days. 
and as you go forward, you'll realize that there was a great disappointment in October 1844 as a result of Mingla not being able to interpret these days correctly. And it happens, and it has happened. Mingla was very sincere. It is not like some people who come to tell you that Christ is coming in 2014, so do this, sell your properties, hide there, hide there. Miller was actually very sincere. He was reading the Bible. He was trying to find the truth. Uh, the events that happened thereafter are so many. So please, again, sending you back to this. God's divine timing is his time. The Lord's second coming, no one knows when he will come. But he knows the trumpet will surely blow. So the second coming of Christ is as urgent as it was first mentioned. Do not tire. The promise may tarry, but it is sure and true. Thank you so much for joining us for this study. Next week, we move to another kind of hard title, <laughs> Light from the Sanctuary. Uh, please again join us. And do not tire from sharing the link with your friends and your families. Do not tire from reading the book, The Great Controversy. We really insist and pray that you read because there's so many truths that you need to learn. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome again next time. We ask our brother Chris Paul to pray for us to close. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for indeed we have... As you've read from your word, you have told us that we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. This day, Lord, thank you because of this wonderful prophecy that we have studied from your word. We just pray, Lord, that the lessons of uh, rejection of Christ, the lesson of how you dealt tenderly with Israel of old, and how you still are dealing with us may be firmly uh, etched in our minds. And Lord, we may prepare urgently to meet you in the skies uh, in your second coming that is even at the door. Father, prepare us for that day. Prepare our families for that day. Prepare everyone who is watching for that great day when you shall come. For we ask this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.